So here we are again. Wasn't that long ago that uh, we had a, a chat about your latest book, which is great, but this is your hundredth podcast episode. And I'm going to start by asking you something you probably don't get asked enough because you're always on the road, you're always promoting stuff, you know, you work so hard, but how are you? How am I? Uh, <laughs> it's a tricky one to answer that because generally I'm pretty good, but I've had a challenging uh, few days for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know how much to go into, but, you know, I've had to take my son to A&E a couple of times over the past uh, 10 days, which was a little bit uh, worrying and stressful at times. And the Sunday just gone, I, but, you know, that's the second time I took him. I was in A&E uh, four or five hours. And then as soon as I came out with him, uh, I got a text saying my mum had fallen and that she was waiting in an ambulance to come into hospital to so the same A&E. Um, and as you know, you know, my mum lives very nearby, me and my brother, we try our best to sort of pop round regularly, normally daily to see how she is, check she's doing all right. Uh, but she ended up getting admitted. She wasn't so well and, uh, she has managed to come out. I got her out on Monday night. Um, but I've spent the last two nights sort of sleeping on her floor in a house just to check she's okay. And she's got her mobility back. So I didn't actually know if I was going to be able to come down today. Um, mm -hmm. so how am I? I'm, I'm okay, but I'm pretty tired and pretty frazzled at the moment, if I'm honest. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, lots going on, lots of stress. Yeah. And, um, well, it's good news about your mum being, being all right. And, um, you know, and that's the, the most important thing, I guess. But you, you know, in terms of your hundredth episode, focusing on the fact that you, you are here and we're, we're here to sort of, in a way, celebrate that. What are your kind of reflections on the fact that, you know, a hundred, a hundred's a big number. When you think about a footballer, having a hundred caps, that means they've been putting it out consistently. It's, it's not something that's easy to reach. A hundred podcast episodes is a bit of a milestone, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's funny to actually think it's a hundred because it's now become such a regular and consistent part of my life. I mean, you know, one of the things I do now is release a weekly Wednesday podcast, but you know, just over two years ago, I didn't. So it's, it's remarkable to think that from two years ago, um, just starting this off as a, as a bit of a whim, a bit of an idea, really. I, I really, at that time, didn't have any plans beyond six episodes. I thought, put six out there, see what happens. I didn't really think beyond that. I didn't really think about um, putting it out for 100 episodes or 50. I just thought, let's put six out and see what happens. And... You know, I had no idea the amount of work it entails to do that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Thinking back now for where it started to where it is now, 100 episodes, yeah, I'm really proud of it because that's a lot of episodes and that's real consistency week upon week. And, you know, often I've been up super late on a Tuesday night. Um, later, well, that's late for me, right? I go to bed early. Um, trying to record intros and outros so we can hit our Wednesday 1 p.m. slot, which is what we try and do. And it's probably one of the funnest things I do, this podcast. I love it. Um, I love the, the impact it's having. I love the messages I get every single day when people are telling me that it, this podcast has changed their life. It's making them think more broadly about health. Um, I've had all kinds of just lovely messages that I don't really share. People have reversed their anxiety, sorted out their depression, um, you know, lost significant amounts of weight, getting sleeping better than they have done for years, improving their relationships, you know, understanding their choices better. I do a lot of these kind of emotional podcasts where we talk about thoughts and how our beliefs can impact our health. But I feel a bit emotional as well thinking about it. There's a yeah. hundred episodes, um, you know, it, it feels good. And I guess we had this idea, didn't we, about trying to celebrate that by having you interview me. Um, but, you know, as I, as I said to you before, if I'm honest, last night, I didn't know whether this would happen. Yeah. I didn't know if I'd be coming down to London today. Uh, but I feel happy that I've managed to get everything in place yeah. at home and, and with my mum. So I feel, yeah, I, I can come down and do yeah, it. That's great. And talking about the podcast, because it is, it is, it does give the viewer, the listener, a lot, I think, you know, and I, I, I love it. And I really enjoy listening to it myself as a consumer, as a listener. But what, what do you get out of it? Yeah, what do I get out of it? Um, quite a lot, actually. Quite a lot. I think the 
biggest thing I get out of recording this podcast is, you know, real mindful time. Uh, what I mean by that is, I realize that these conversations for me are a bit like therapy in some ways, because you know, we've spoken about this on the on the podcast before, but we're living in an era of information overload where we are constantly being distracted. All of us, you know, we've been distracted by devices. You know, we're, it's very hard for us to be present with the people that we love because our phones are just sort of there, just there in, in, in your eyes view and, you, you know, just pulling you away to check your email or check your Instagram. And, you know, you're married as am I, you know, that feeling, I'm sure, mm. when either you or your wife and someone, yeah. one of you is distracted when you try and have a conversation with each other. And it's, I think it's incredibly toxic on many levels. And I think it's become the norm in society. But coming back to what you're asking me about the podcast, it's, you know, I get to have these amazing long form conversations now with people and, you know, the conversations are much longer than they used to be. And I really enjoy these longer conversations, but I get to sit across the table, maybe one to two foot away from someone, basically look them in the eyes for almost two hours, not looking at phones, not being distracted, being completely present with that other human being. So, it's a practice of mindfulness for me. It teaches me how to be present. It teaches me how to stay focused for a prolonged period of time, which I think helps me in other aspects of my life. So I think that's one thing it really gives me. Hmm. Um, I think the other thing it teaches me about, I think the other thing it teaches me is about trust. And what I mean by that is, as you've already alluded to, I'm super busy, as are most people these days. Mm. I don't, I wouldn't like to make the case that I'm busier than anyone else. I think we <laughs> all feel busy in our lives. I think that's actually a, ma a massive problem on one level that we're all feeling overwhelmed and, and burdened. Um, but sometimes I've got a podcast interview lined up. You've got to remember, I still see patients every week. Um, I'm writing a book a year at the moment. Um, trying to put out this weekly podcast as well as spend time with my wife, as well as spend time with my kids. I help to look after my elderly mum. You know, it, it's not easy. And I am committed to doing it and I love doing it. And I very much try and uh, live the advice that I talk about. I'm not perfect, but generally speaking, I think I managed to. But often I'll have a podcast interview in the diary that was maybe scheduled three weeks ago. And, you know, I haven't researched properly. I haven't managed to read the book that the author has, you know, coming on to talk about. Um, and it used to stress me out. I'd be trying to cram it in and try and look at all this information. And then the penny dropped one day. And I thought, wrong and look, these podcasts are conversations, right? You know how to converse with someone, right? You've been conversing with people all your life. Um, as a doctor, right? What are we doing as GPs? We're conversing, we're having conversations with our patients. So for me, in some ways, I've been podcasting my entire life because all I'm doing is having a conversation. And, and why I said it's taught me about trust is because I just have to trust myself. Like if I haven't had time to research the guest properly, right? Yes, I could cancel it. I could get stressed out, but I don't particularly like those two options. So... <laughs> I figure out I'll sit here and I'll just be present and I'll ask them questions that I'm interested in and they'll respond. And if I think carefully and if I listen carefully, I have to trust myself that I will know what the right thing to say next is. Hmm. And it's not something you do right at the start. Like I didn't do it at the start. You know, I would have a list of questions at the start. Now, often I'd ignore them and just follow the conversation. But now I often show up to these podcasts with no questions there. And you've got to trust yourself to do that. You've got to trust yourself that if you get stuck or if your mind wanders, and you know what? It does wander sometimes. That's the truth. I've got to have enough trust in myself and self-belief that I will know what to say. And um, I've got to say, I think those, those are probably the, the biggest two things I get from the podcast. Apart from, you know, meeting incredible people, uh, you know, being able to pick their brain about stuff that I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah. I think those two things, being mindful and learning to trust myself are probably the two biggest things that my podcast gives me. It's, it's a great thing to, to watch as well, because I think, you know, because you, you're a doctor and doctor in, in ancient Greek and in, in lots of other languages means teacher, doesn't it? And 
what I love about the podcast personally is that this this kind of cyclical learning teaching thing that goes on between you and the guest. But it's not an obvious. It's not like a lecture, is it? It is a conversation, and there's some there's, there is something magical going on in a lot of them. It, 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 it's a conversation, and I don't think if, if you'd asked me the, that question, or if you'd asked me about my podcast two years ago, just after it started, right? I would have thought. I would have said to you that my podcast is a way of delivering information to people, trying to educate people, right? And I'm not saying it's not now. But, but it's, what, it's sort of not, it, but it is. It, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm. It's it's not about information delivery anymore. It's about connection, mm. right? It's about connection. So the podcast is a conversation. And I think the quality of the podcast and the impact it has isn't necessarily to do with the information that's imparted. I think it's to do with the authenticity and the connection I have with the guest. And I think if you connect well with that guest, I think information delivery comes as a pleasant side effect of that. And it is quite profound for me that, and I don't think I got that at the start of the podcast, but I've reflected on why it appears to be so popular, why so many people seem to be listening and sharing them with their friends. And I, I figured out that this is about human connection. And that's actually one of the reasons why I very, very rarely do Skype calls. Uh, you can do Skype interviews. And I did a couple right at the start. But I haven't done one in a long time. I insist that they're done face-to-face because I think there's a certain magic about being face-to-face, about being two foot away from that person, being able to look into their eyes and see their facial expressions. Mm. I think that lends itself to a certain quality of conversation doesn't mean I will never do a Skype interview. I'm, if I get a guest who I, you know, simply can't get in any other way, yes, I would be interested. Um, and a lot of people suggest really amazing podcast guests for me. Um, I, bet I, you get, I bet you get that every day. Yeah. You know, it's... It, I, I, I'll tell you what, I, I meet people who want to be on your podcast and I'm like, join the queue, buddy. <laughs> it's, look, I'm, I'm a very... But, um, I'm very, I mean, look, I'm really flattered great, that that yeah. many people want to come on. Yeah, yeah. And I think at the start, that would have been fine. But now we actually need a way of figuring out who should come on because there's too many people who want to come on. And, you know, mm. as I've spoken about before, I, I am a recovering people pleaser. So, you know, it's yeah. not something that comes easy to me saying no, or it's not about saying no for me, right? Well, what it's about, I, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you how I choose a guest. The number one criteria for me when I'm choosing a guest is am I interested in that person and that topic? Yeah. I mean, that's what it's about for me yeah. because if I'm not interested, I think the audience is going to pick that up. I think they're going to get bored. And, and you, just before I forget, because it's in my mind, that so I totally get that completely. But the doctor thing, you know, because you, you know, you and I are medics, aren't we? We went to med school. Do you still feel that this is part of that, the podcast? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it, and it's something I thought a lot about. I, I thought a lot about this recently. I think it absolutely is. So I guess it's the question really for me is what does it mean to be a doctor? You know, what is that definition of doctor? What do we think a doctor should be? Well, a doctor is fundamentally someone who helps people, right? You know, mm. you know. But by one definition, it's about helping people who are in need of help. People uh, who are not feeling so well, they come and see us wanting advice on how they can feel better. Or it might be someone who's worried about something they've read online or their friends had something or their mums had something. They want to come and get a bit of reassurance, right? So my mm. job as a doctor is about making and helping people to feel better with whatever tools I have available to me. Typically, those tools have been medicine, you know, certainly in the in the West. And I guess we can talk about what, what that medicine should be. Um, one definition of medicine that I've read is that it's a drug or other preparation that is used to treat disease or prevent illness, which I think is, you know, a pretty good definition of what we regard medicine to be. And so I feel through this podcast, but through the other things that I do as well, that I am treating people. I am helping people. I'm helping them to prevent illness. I'm helping them to feel better. I'm hopefully helping them to reduce symptoms. I'm helping them reverse their illness. And, you know, who says that has to be done in the consultation room? 
You know, I love seeing patients in the consultation room. Mm, I've been doing that yeah. for almost 20 years now, right? I love it. I, I don't particularly want to stop doing that because I really enjoy it. But as people may have heard me say before, 80% of what we see as doctors today is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles. You know, hey, and I'm not putting blame on people. Right. I, I get it that life is difficult. Life is stressful. Um, people are juggling multiple things. Um, you know, everyone I meet wants to feel better than they currently do. They want to make changes, but they don't feel they've got the time, right? So I get that. But here's, here's the question for me then. If 80% of what I see as a doctor is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles, then is the best way for me to help people one-on-one -on -one in clinic or could it potentially be through podcasts and through books and through TV shows or documentaries where you can empower people with information, inspire them through storytelling to really connect with them and actually make them feel afterwards that, hey, look, oh, I can do this. I can do that. So whilst I still do see patients, I think my role as a podcast host and as an author is absolutely consistent with that for doctor. Now, is it the role I thought I would be in when I went to medical school? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very different question and, and absolutely not. I thought I'm going to go to medical school to learn the tools that I needed to help my patients get better. And I thought that would be in a consultation room or in a hospital. So, you know, I think things have developed a lot, but I think, I think all of this stuff is absolutely consistent with what I think a doctor is. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. It, it has changed. And a lot of it is to do with cultural um, stereotyping. So, you know, Peppa Pig's a good example. You know, Dr. Brown Bear <laughs> in Peppa Pig, he comes on a home visit at the drop of a hat and he always gives out this pink medicine and this, this idea of the doctor treating something. But then I watched something the other day, which well, I haven't seen since I was a kid. I'm sure you might remember it. It's this thing on Sesame Street called Who Are the People in Your Neighbourhood? Do you remember that song? Who are the people in your neighborhood? That one. Yeah. Anyway, so they, so they have sort of the grocer and the, the doctor. And actually the doctor's one was that uh, the doctor works hard all day long to keep you feeling healthy and strong, which I thought was this from the seventies. And actually that's kind of what you do, isn't it? That, you know, that's sort of the preventive element of medicine, which used to get ignored. But it's not just prevention. I think this is a really common misunderstanding about the role of lifestyle, the role of nutrition and health, right? Whenever you talk about it, people say, oh yeah, yeah, prevention is better than cure, right? And I get that. I understand <laughs> yeah. that on one level. Of course it is. But we think lifestyle is only relevant for prevention. And it's simply not true. Lifestyle can also be used as the treatment. It may not be enough in itself, but often it is. And so I don't think I'm just offering people prevention. I'm also offering people, I hope, practical tips and tools in the books, in the podcasts, and on through social media accounts that they can actually think, hey, you know what? I might try that and see what happens. And look, I mean, this is fresh in my mind because the new book's only been out a couple of months now. But I'm getting messages from people now that it's been out for two months. People got a message this week saying, Dr. Sashi, love it. I could not believe that these three five-minute health snacks a day have helped me lose a stone and a half in weight wow. in the last two months, right? Uh, someone else told me her anxiety symptoms have almost disappeared from doing the Feel Better in Five plan. Um, someone told me her blood sugars have come down significantly since starting the Feel Better in Five plan. And so for me, it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. That's not prevention. These are people who've got symptoms, uh, you know, anxiety, excess weight, um, you know, whatever it is. And that's what I'm passionate to get across to people, um, not to lecture them. I really hope that I don't lecture people. I, I don't think I do. Right, I mean, for right. me, it's about giving people information. Um, I love talking to people on the podcast who've got interesting stories because you know why? We learn through stories, you know, information because sometimes we just too dry hearing as just as black and white facts. Sure, yeah. that can be helpful, but hearing a good narrative around it where someone who's maybe lived through something, I think that has power. So yeah, I or would like to think I'm broadening out people's view on what medicine should be and what medicine can be. Um, and you know, I think I'm also moving life, you know, along with many other people, I might say, moving the conversation on from just being, you know, diet and movement to so much more. Mm. 
Uh, and that's the feedback that I get a lot. Um, yeah. either on, you know, the podcast apps or, uh, on, on my social media accounts, people say, Oh, you're, you're making me think about all the other factors that are relevant for my health. Do you know, there's a moment when, you know, the, the course we do together and I kind of set the scene and open the day and then you come on and there, there is this moment because the room's full of GPs generally where you start talking about glute four receptors or the microbiome and all this kind of technical stuff and you sort of see, because actually I think the thing with you is you're so good at communicating these concepts simply that people forget there's a lot of science behind it. And there's this moment where the whole room thinks, wow, he really knows this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure you've noticed that yeah, yourself. Yeah, you know, but, um, I mean, as in, as in, you know, the way it's talked about in, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, feel better and fine is a really good example. The interventions are really simple and it's very easy to think that well, hang on, there's, what's, what's new here? But actually, they're so clever, aren't they? Because it's based on, on that complex science. Yeah, this is something I've really had to wrestle with, Ian, if I'm yeah. honest. Yeah. I've really had to wrestle with this because I remember when I sat down to write my first book, The Four Pillar Plan. Mm. I remember, first time I've ever written a book, I was sitting there writing and, you know, like a lot of doctors, mm. um, and I was saying a lot of doctors who, you know, either writing books or putting them out, putting themselves out there in the mm. media. And there's a bit of a fear, you know, how are you going to be perceived? You don't want to offend anyone, you know, because yeah. the culture we grew up in as medics means we don't want to do any of that. We want to, you know, keep everyone happy, play it safe, that kind of stuff. Mm. We're also very, very keen to, um, be accepted by our colleagues. And I remember when I first started to sit down and write that book that I was thinking, right, you know, I really want doctors to like this, you know, and um, I'd put in loads and loads of science or loads of research studies. And I, I was reflecting and looking at it thinking, wait a minute, why are you writing this book? Yeah. Right. I'm writing this book not to show off how much I know, but to help people change their lives. Mm. And I thought, if that's your goal, Rongen, then make it understandable. Make it simple and understandable so that the people you want to impact can easily digest the information and easily put it into practice. But the weird thing that happened was by doing that, doctors seem to love it as well. Mm. And I think, you know, we, there's literally thousands of doctors now in the UK who are prescribing the four-pillar plan to their patients yeah. and using it to learn as well, which is, which is really incredible. And, you know, I, I, one thing I've learned, yes, through the podcast, but also through writing books, and I think you draw a good analogy for Feel Better in Five because I really learned it in that book, is, you know, these books and these podcasts are not about showing off how much I know. They're about action. They're about helping people. And I've realized that the way you communicate is everything, right? How do you communicate that health messaging? I don't want to just give people information. Uh, I say on the outro to most podcasts, I don't want you just to be inspired by this podcast and then go back to living your everyday life as per normal. No, I want people to take action from that inspiration. And I think simplicity is key. And yeah, I've had to uh, wrestle with my own ego issues over that. Because I know some people probably think, oh God, it's a bit simple. He doesn't know much more than that. But that's an ego thing in my head mm. because actually there is complex science behind them. I just try my best to keep it simple. Mm. And yeah, you're right. It is nice for me to, to run that course. And, you know, we've had, you know, over a thousand doctors go through it now, mm. learning from us. Mm. And yes, on one level, it's nice that they know that I do understand the complexity of all these receptors and what's actually going on. Yeah. And that's, I guess, what I love about my career at the moment is that I can teach doctors and specialists on our course so I can make it high level. I can communicate on the podcast. And often that's uh, sometimes can be really in-depth conversations with really world-leading scientists. But then I can also convert all of that, I hope, into really practical information for people through the book. So I feel I get to do it all, really, yeah. um, by having all these multiple streams. But but it's interesting you picked up on that, actually. I'm going to, uh, it's probably a bit of an unfair question, but which episode out of the hundred that you've done so far sticks in your mind the most? I mean, how do you choose between, it's like, well, I wouldn't say it's like asking to choose between your kids. I wouldn't quite go that far, <laughs> yeah. but that is hard. Uh, out of the hundred episodes. There's been some crackers, haven't there? What was the question? Was it one? Yeah, yeah, you can't have more than one. That'd be unfair. Oh, can't we, can't, oh. <laughs> okay. a, lot, a lot of people want to know the answer. What's in your head? Like, you know, 
I mean, there's two that come to my mind at the moment. I'm just going to really try. And as I sit here today, right now, mm. which episode has had the most impact? Mm, yeah. Um, I think if I have to choose one, which mm. I do, mm. I'd have to say it was the episode I did with Gabor Mate. Mm. I thought so, you were going to say that. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, I could just because I, I, you can hear in your voice the kind of emotion by the end of it. You'd gone on this sort of spectacular journey this, during this conversation and it kind of opened loads. I just loved it. That's my favourite one as well. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember the episode now. I think it was something like 39, 37. Mm. So, you know, relatives are episode 100 in the early days. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that one has probably had the most impact on me. Mm. Uh, I've, I'd followed Gabo's work for a while mm. and I think for me to sit across the table with him and him to also get what I'm doing. And we really connected. We really got on. It was a really, it was just great on so many levels. Professionally, it was great. Personally, it was great. And I think seeing the impact, because for me, that was taking a bit of a risk, right? I, I like to take risk on the podcast. I don't like to play it safe. I don't mm. want to give people the same information each week. I want to talk to a wide variety of mm. different people about all kinds of different things. And of course, not everyone's going to love every week, but that's Okay. You know, I hope the variety is what's going to keep people interested. And the impacts from that episode, that was, I think, the first... Well, I put that on YouTube. That was the first YouTube video I had that went viral. Like, it just connected with people and they wanted to share it. And I think the reason it's had so much impact on me personally as well is because it really helps us understand, both myself and I, I hope a lot of the listeners, that what happens to us in our childhood, how we're treated, how we respond to certain situations can have implications for the rest of our life unless we look into it and start to tackle it and start to go, okay, wait a minute, this behavior served me as a child, but I'm not sure it's serving me anymore as an adult. And I think Gabor Mate's work as well as many other people, has really influenced me and my own journey through that process. Um, particularly, I'd say now, you know, it's almost seven years since my dad died. I think that's when that journey started for me, really. Just as you touched on your dad, who who obviously I, I remember very well. I mean, in terms of, and I'm moving it on a little bit, but, you know, he's a big influence in your life. Would you say he you know, in terms of big influences in your life, it's hardly unfair to ask who the biggest would have been, but your dad, I, I would guess, is he who, is he who you'd say has had the biggest influence on you? Yeah. I mean, who's had the biggest impact on my life? I mean, yeah, that, I mean, I mean, that's really hard to say, isn't it? Who's mm. had the biggest? Mm. I mean, there's clearly lots of people who've had impacts. Mm. Um, you know, when I think about a question like that, I think about my parents, mm. of course. I mean, I think, you know, they are the ones who bring you up and who instill their values in you and you learn from, you know, good or bad, you tend to learn from the mm. way they do things yeah. and start to, that becomes who, the way you do things as well, because that's what you've seen. I certainly think my mum and dad have been huge influences on my life, mm. no question. Um, you know, dad, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like last week I was on, so, so for people who don't know, my dad was unwell for 15 years. He retired. He had to medically retire. He was a consultant physician at the Manchester Ward Infirmary. I don't think he'd ever taken a day off sick in his life. Mm. And at the age of 57, 58, he got unwell and he suddenly got uh, lupus and then he got kidney failure. So he had this autoimmune disease. He had kidney failure and basically it was on dialysis for 15 years, three times a week. Mm. Um, everything in our lives changed. Um, all the decisions I've made as an adult, because that happened when I was at medical school, probably about 20 years old. Um, everything changed. You know, that's one of the reasons I live in the Northwest of England. I moved back to help look after my dad, which I did for 15 years until dad died. And that has been so, you know, it's a funny, you know, saying who's had the biggest influence. It, I can't answer that necessarily, but my dad, my dad's illness, and actually being a carer for 15 years, which you could say indirectly is from my dad, that has had a profound influence on me as a person, 
as a doctor. You know, being on the other side, seeing what a chronically ill patient suffers with, the the stress that puts on the whole family, um, seeing how amazingly my mother cared for him for that mm. period of time and just seeing what amazing uh, dedicated care can do. To, to think that that hasn't influenced me as a person or, or the way I treat patients, I think it would be unrealistic. Uh, you know, I don't know what sort of doctor I would have been without that. So I'd mm. like to think I'd be a compassionate doctor, but I don't think I would have the insight that that's given me. So I think mm. my parents through their, uh, you know, bringing me up through, through, through my whole life, but also through my dad's illness, absolutely massive influence. And, you know, I, I sort of feel that I process a lot of that and I feel pretty okay with things now because I do feel my dad had lived this life. He really wasn't well the last little while. It was pretty, it was pretty hellish really the last few months for all yeah. of us. Um, so I think it's for dad. I think it's, it's best for him that, that he's not around, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, you see your mum almost every day, don't you? I mean, most days um, yeah. when, you're, when you're at home and she's obviously seen your journey through books, TV, podcasts, you know, all the sort of success in inverted commas that you're enjoying. It's obviously sad that your dad's not around to see that, but do you think he would, what do you think he would say in terms of, would he get this, this whole prevention thing? You know, I, th I, th I thought about that so many times mm. um, because my dad was a, you know, he went to medical school in, in Calcutta in India. He came over to the UK, very much like your dad's, uh, to, you know, to try and set up a new life and give his family a really good quality of living that he didn't perceive he could do in India for us. And, you know, I think, I, I don't know what dad would think. I think he'd be very proud. Mm. And, and on what I used to be gutted that the things that my dad would have been proudest of the most because I know how my dad's brain used to work. Mm. Um, like, you know, his son, you know, this is an Indian immigrant to the country, to this country, right? So dad's an Indian immigrant here, comes here with hardly any money in, I think, mm. 1962, and literally makes everything from scratch himself, puts up with all kinds of stuff. I mean, don't know how deep you want to go, you know, racism uh, within and outside the NHS, which is very, very well established, what used to happen. And we can argue about whether it still happens mm. or not. Uh, but, mm. um, you know, dad comes here and, you know, they, they would hold the BBC in such esteem, right? So to have his own son have his own BBC One show, um, you know, I, I think, I think I could just imagine my dad's face. Yeah. Um, and then to have, you know, three Sunday Times bestsellers each year, you know, for the last three years, I think my dad would be so, so proud. But, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, upset me anymore. Mm. Like, I feel my dad is here in everything that I do. Like, if dad was still around today, I wouldn't be doing any of this. That's the irony, right? Mm. If my dad was still alive, mm. being a carer takes so much out of you, mm. physically, mentally, emotionally, I wouldn't have energy for anything. Mm. I barely had enough energy to spend time with my own family. Mm. That's how much caring took out of us. And so... And that's why I think I found the last few days so, um, you know, so, so, so hard at times because it reminds me that you know, being in A&E for hours, I think my mum was there for about 10 hours, 10 hours. Mm. Like, um, and I'm, I'm not going to go at anyone. I get it. Everyone's, you know, the staff were incredible. They were trying to do their best, right? And then waiting for ages to be transferred to another ward and mum's getting more confused because she's out of her own environment and it's dark and it's you know it just brought back all those memories of yeah. what life used to be like every single week for 15 years yeah um so and actually last week i i got a i i i, I remember i got a taxi to media city in manchester to go on mm -hmm. um radio five live for, for, for an appearance and the taxi driver who picked me up I was chanting for the first 20 minutes. I was, I was in a super chatty mood that day. Doesn't surprise you, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, you know, towards, as we were getting there, he said, oh, you really remind me of your dad, you know? I said, I, I sort of said to him, he goes, oh, you know, I picked you up before, you know, I, I used to take your dad to dialysis for the first three years. Wow. I remembered. And he was one of the, he used to work for a taxi firm that had the renal contracts at Windershaw Hospital. So he would take my dad's three times a week to dialysis there and back. And I said, okay, cool. You know, what, what, what is it about me that reminds you of my dad's? 
And he said, it's just everything. The way you talk, your mannerisms, the way you finish sentences. I, I, I could literally be here with your dad. And, you know, I was really emotional thinking about that. So it's like, oh my God, this guy used to take dad all the time. And dad was super chatty as well. So <laughs> yeah. um, it, it was it was interesting. It was, it was nice when that stuff like that happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I genuinely think like most parents, my parents did the best that they could for me mm. with their understanding, with their uh, resources, you know, both financial and mental and whatever. I think they did the best for me. And, and I've only recently been able to look at that now with a slight detached, um, with, with less emotion. I think mm. Gabo Mate and our, my conversation with him, I think that's one of the reasons it's so impactful for me is that I was on that journey anyway before I spoke to Gabo. But looking back at my childhood now with detachment and going, you know what, this stuff was great, but that stuff probably wasn't so great. And that's not me having a go at my parents, No, mm, right? True. That's me with the utmost love saying, guys, you did a great job. I, mm. you, 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 you did the, the best, best you could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but actually these things possibly weren't so great. Mm. And these are things that have probably impacted me in my life and they're things that I have um, really worked hard on changing over the last few years. And it has really helped me. It's helped me feel calmer. It's helped me feel more secure in myself. And so why that episode? And, it, you know, the other episode I was thinking of was the Peter Crone episode, which is, I think, something like 82 or 83. Um, the reason why I think those types of episodes have the most impact on me, because they almost mirror what I'm doing in my own life, which is really understanding how our emotions, how our thoughts, how our childhood programming determines so much of how we feel, you know, years later. Mm. And I know I've had the biggest impacts on my health and the way I feel about myself by, you know, really working on those bits. Mm. It's, so, it's fascinating, isn't it? And it's just uh, that moment of realization when you, when you realize that actually there is a link. And I, th I think for me, it happened once when I remember doing something that was exactly the same as my dad would do. And I thought, Turning into my dad, you know, it's an, it's an odd yeah. thing, isn't it? It's an odd feeling. I'm going to have a bit of fun now, if that's all right. So, I think I think you know, there are. The, I've got a list of things I want to ask you, and it's quick fire. I don't want to think about them too much. Okay. This is really okay. sort of really for you know people who follow you to give give them a bit more sort of bit, it's a bit of fun, but just a bit more about what you think. Should, and I, what should you, I be what worried like. at all? Not that worried. Not that worried. <laughs> And, and it's just, it's, it's kind of a, a what, you know, it's a this or that thing. So you just have to pick one of the two choices in terms of what you prefer. So running or swimming? Uh, running. Kale or spinach? Kale. Thai or Chinese food? Thai. 100% Thai. Wait, did you say kale instead of spinach? Yeah. I'm shocked. We'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> city or countryside? Countryside. Liverpool or Man United? Oh my God, Liverpool. <laughs> Times or Telegraph? Ta oh, Telegraph. <laughs> Good save. Um, ketchup they or brown sauce? They have serialised my first three books. I know, I was just thinking <laughs> that. Ketchup or brown sauce? Oof, I don't really have either now, but ketchup, if I had to choose. Jeans or tracksuit bottoms? Tracky bottoms. Plane or train? Train. Mac or PC? Mac. Beats or Bose? Bose. Oh, mate, no. Honestly, we can argue about that later. Dispatch bag or rucksack? I don't know what a dispatch bag is, so I'm going to go rucksack. <laughs> <laughs> like a record bag, but kind of like rectangular. Hey, you got all these but, fancy terms anyway. here down south. Um, do you, I mean, you know, that's a bit of fun, but I mean, I think that's useful because, you know, and you said tracksuit bottoms instead of jeans. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. But do you, what do you do? Well, what do you prefer, jeans or tracksuit bottoms? Jeans, yeah, I don't know. I just, I've, I've got one pair of tracksuit bottoms and I just find them really kind of itchy. Yeah. yeah. I don't find them comfy. You know, like hoodies are really hey, comfy. If they're itchy, maybe you should get a different material. <laughs> Where are those questions? I want to ask you them back now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I write them. But you know, um, you, you, we, you mentioned earlier on, you've, when we were talking about your dad, you know, that you've, you've written these best selling books, you've done TV work. You've got like a wide palette of activity, but your sort of purpose is quite singular in a way. It's pretty obvious. They all tie in, don't they? D d do you plan on doing any more TV work? Are you, I mean, what are your, what are you working on at the moment? You know, is there anything in the pipeline? Yeah. I mean, there's, 
I mean, there's lots in the pipeline as always, but I think there's quite a few elements to that question for me. And one of them is, you know, what is that mission, right? And the mission that I have is over the course of my career, I would like to help 100 million people around the world transform the way that they feel, right? Mm. It's pretty simple. Uh, you know, I want to help inspire 100 million people to know that they can be the architects of their own health. Mm. Right? So that's the mission. And again, I didn't know this stuff. I, I couldn't articulate that. Even, I'm going to guess, four years ago or three years ago. I mean, this is stuff that I've worked on as part of that emotional process, which I was talking to you about. Yeah. It's not just about my childhood and my upbringing. It's about everything that I do and who am I as a person and what is it that gets me out of bed every morning and what is it that drives me to work hard and you know do all the things that I do. And it was a very hard process to come up with that as a mission. Um but I feel very comfortable with it. It is scary for me. You know, people say, well, how will you know if you get 100 million people? Well, I don't. And in some ways, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just a way for me to uh, make decisions about my work. Um, and is this going to impact the lives of a lot of people or mm. not? And so tying that in with TV shows, right, I have recently turned down to, you know, TV series on... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, won't, I can't really say wh who or what they are, mm, sure. but I have turned down two of my own series on uh, mainstream British TV mm. channels in a way that I possibly wouldn't have done for four or five years ago because they will not help me get to that 100 million mark, mm. right? So they're not the sort of shows that I think are going to help me inspire and empower people with information to improve that they're their mm. lives mm. right so therefore for me it makes it easy to make decisions because i've done tv shows before right but they have been consistent with that mm. as soon as i feel that something is not i'm not interested because i'm not doing this to be on telly mm. right if i'm yeah. not on telly again that's fine right i'm not it, that's not what drives me tv is a medium to get to a lot of people mm. right so you know, my first two series in Doctor and House were watched by about 5 million people in the UK each week, right? That's gone to 70 countries around the world. I, I don't know how many people ha have now seen it, but it will be, you know, probably close yeah. to 10 million. Yeah. Right? It's, a lot, it's a big, it's a lot of reach, isn't it? It's but, a lot of yeah. reach. So if 1% of people who have watched that show made some change in their lifestyle to improve the way that they feel, mm. you know, if you just go on the 5 million number, what's that? That is... I'm tired, so I might get this wrong, 50,000, mm. right? If it's 10% of people, that's half a million, mm. right? So suddenly now you're like, hold on a minute. So media and television and podcasts and books all tie in with what you asked me before, which is what does it mean to be a doctor now? Mm. Are you still being a doctor? Yeah, mm. because everything I try and do is to help mm. give people that information that's going to improve it the way that they feel. And so many people have contacted me and said, hey, look, I've now got on top of my health conditions. I don't need to see my doctor anymore. And yeah. that excites me because, you know, you know, the National Health Service is under strain. Right? We are struggling to cope with the demand on it. And I think there's many reasons for that. But if if I and other people, it's not just me, there's loads of people doing this, right? There's loads of people who are trying to empower mm. uh, their audience with this kind of information, which is great. I think the more voices in this, the, 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 yeah. the better, really. But, but, but what happens is that by doing that, um, I think people are improving their lives that often don't need to go and see their doctor now for stuff mm. that they might have done. So in some ways, this is, yes, helping them, but in some ways, it might also be taking some of the strain off the NHS. Mm. I know so many doctors prescribe this podcast to their patients. They go, hey, look, you know, I think this is going to help you. Listen to episode 73. Yeah. I'll see you in three weeks to discuss, uh, you know, what you thought and what you can take from mm. it. And that excites me. So I absolutely feel that this stuff is helping people with their health. And I just think it's time to redefine mm. what that role of a doctor really yeah. is I, I, yeah and you're, you're definitely doing that in my eyes i mean for sure and a, a lot of my patients listen to your podcast but i, I want to bring something up that's a bit possibly a co bit controversial you, you what you were just talking about i'm going to bring up influencers because there's a lot of people out there on social media in that sort of health space you know I, i'm not massively active on social media for lots of reasons one is i don't have a lot of time it's very time consuming 
And secondly, I feel that, you know, like you, who's got very, very firm purpose and, and I do too, but you know, what you post has got to be kind of worthwhile. And there's a lot of toxicity out there and a lot of, do you know what I mean? Do I ever, yeah. It, what's your view on that? Because I, I, it's, it's very confusing for, you know, someone, a, a member of the public to know, you know, who's reliable, who's to trust, so-and-so slagging off so-and-so, and suddenly there's, you know, the, the kind of knives come out and, you know, and I, I hate that stuff. Yeah, but what, it, what's I, I think it's a great, I think you've it? really touched on, I think one of the most important topics that, that, that exists at the moment is where do we get our information from? Hmm. And I mean, there are so many strands of that question and I, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts on this, which I'm very happy to share. Um, I think it's really important, really important. I think so. Yeah. So where do people get their information from? I think it's tricky because I, I'm an optimist, right? And I, I generally believe in the good of people and I mm. believe that people are, whoever they are, are trying to share information that's going to help people. I really think yeah. by and large, most people are trying to do that. Mm. Now, I don't subscribe to the view that you should only be sharing health information if you are a qualified healthcare professional. I don't at all. I know mm. that's not the prevailing narrative. I think, I, I couldn't think, um, I couldn't disagree with that more because I think we've all got something to share. And, you know, you can have a qualified healthcare professional who's done a certain degree. And even within that, people will disagree on the right thing to do. So I don't think that necessarily means you've got a badge of, um, you know, like quality assurance. Sure, I think it can help, Mm. but I don't necessarily think, I think that will surprise people. Like, I just think everyone should be allowed to share the information that they want to share. Mm. Right? I fundamentally believe that. Now, what does that mean for the audience, right? Well, for the audience, I think, yes, I think seeing a qualified healthcare professional and actually following them might be a good start. But again, look, if you just take diet, for example, right, you could, you could follow a qualified doctor, you could follow, you could follow 10 qualified medical doctors, and they could all be preaching 10 different things. One could say it's all about being vegan. One could say it's about being a car- on a carnivore diet. One could say it's about being low carb. One could say the whole lot of that is a load of nonsense. So we should all be eating whatever we want and just count our calories, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. You could get the same with nutritionists. So even if someone's got a tick after their name saying, I'm a healthcare professional, mm. you can still have this kind of uh, complete confusion, which does exist. Mm. Now, one thing I am super passionate about is the way we behave online. And frankly, the thing that concerns me more than anything within my profession is the inability or reluctance of some doctors who disagree with others to behave in a respectful and polite manner. And one thing I I very much hope I've always done is behave with respect and compassion on social media, even if someone disagrees with me, right? I don't mind disagreement. I don't mind, but if you respectfully disagree, I'll engage with you and have a conversation. Mm. If you're rude or you troll me, I ain't engaging. But my strategy is just to stay out of it and focus on um, positive, meaningful content as much as possible. I just don't engage. Mm. I have carefully curated my feeds so that when I go on them, Mm. generally, it's full of positive information. Now, that doesn't mean I live in an echo chamber, Ian. No, no, right? I get it. Yeah. I follow people with differing views to me, hmm. 100%. Yeah. But I'll follow them when they put them across in a kind and compassionate manner. Hmm. Because here's the thing. A lot of what our brain picks up is subconscious, right? So if we're following toxic people on social media and we're spending 20, 30 minutes, an hour a day on it, what do you think our brain's picking up? Our brain's picking up on that negativity and that toxicity. So I just don't follow people, right? I block, if, I, I don't block many people, but if I find someone really toxic, I'll, I'll block them. I feel if I'm not going to control my digital borders and what I see when I'm online, well, no one else is going to do it for me. And, and I say to everyone, and in fact, to everyone listening to this, I say, look, think about your own feed, you know? Are you getting annoyed, but you, 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 you know, you, you're feeling low or anxious a lot of time? Does, does going on social media sometimes make you feel bad? Well, if it does, I would say, think about which those channels are that make you feel bad and block them or mute them or unfollow. You know, Mm. it's such a simple thing, but curate your own digital world so it's what you want to see. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, I mean, look, you know, we've talked, we've covered loads of stuff, haven't we? You've, I think you are, from where I'm sitting, redefining the way that 
medicines delivered definitely in in a, in a way it's going to sound a bit weird and i not in a you know and i don't mean to sort of demean anyone that works in research or, or public health but what you're doing is kind of like modern public health in some ways isn't it do you know what i mean you're reaching lots of people and and what i'd like to know is if and when we're sat here for the 200th episode what what's in store for the next hundred do you know do you have an inkling what do you think is in store for feel better live more for the next hundred episodes wow another hundred episodes <laughs> it's a, it's a, lot of work. a lot of work yeah um I, I think it really depends and i'll tell you what i mean by that i had no idea before i started a podcast how much work it is um you know, putting out a weekly in-depth conversation that is often now 90 minutes to two hours, getting it edited, getting it out, recording intros and outros, um, being able to finance it and the time and the travel, um, you know, paying for videographers, editing time, finding time to cut social media edits, you know, or it's a full-time job. I don't think I realized because I did it I just sort of fit it in around the rest of my life. And it's actually um, Rich Roll, who was on the podcast recently, who's got one of the biggest podcasts um, globally, which is a fantastic one called the Rich Roll Podcast. Um, Rich said to me when I was on his show recently, he said, he said, I'm going to, I don't quite get how you're doing this because all I do is my podcast. That's my full-time job. Yeah. And you're also writing books, also seeing patients, also going around the country speaking. Like, and I think since then, it really dawned on me, yeah, this is quite a lot of work actually. Mm. I don't, this is like, I didn't, I didn't quite realize. And someone from the BBC said to me the other, the other week, he says, wrong, you're putting out content each week. We, we, for, if it was just a weekly radio show, we have two separate teams. One team is working one week ahead on the next episode. And I'm thinking, oh, no wonder we're all feeling a little bit <laughs> overwhelmed at the moment. So yeah. I think structurally things have to change a little bit. Mm. Um, because, I just, like with everything I've done so far, whether it's TV, books, or podcasts, I've gone on passion. Yeah, I've gone with passion first, and I've figured out how to do it somewhere down the line, which is what I'd always encourage people to do, is don't wait till everything is fixed before you start. Just start. Just do it. And yeah. figure it out as you go. Mm. Um, but what I tell you, you know, what, what, what do I hope? Assuming I've got um, time and resource to do this, I'd love to plan a bit more. I want to talk to as many different voices about as many different things as I possibly can to really, you know, widen people's view of what health is. Mm. What is health? I guess for me, that's the aim, you know, try and get exciting guests, more different guests, just, I don't know, keep doing what I'm doing and hopefully can keep inspiring people each week with these kind of um with these conversations yeah. i think the other thing i want to do um is actually this this is huge actually what's happened with the podcast um is that this is this big sprawling digital community right so people are in their lives somewhere in their car going out for a run you know sitting on their commutes listening through their earphones these conversations mm. But I think that real life human connection is so important. And I would love to start doing live events with the podcast, start bringing people together so you can meet other like-minded individuals. That's already happening. So I've got a private Facebook group, which mm. anyone can join. Yeah. It's called, I think it's called Dr. Chastity Four Pillar Tribe mm. on Facebook. Yeah. And I don't know, I think it's about... I don't know, something like 10,000 people in mm. there now. It's such a warm, supportive group where people ask for advice, they ask for help, and people all go say, oh, have you tried this? Have you tried that? I mean, I'm not on there that much, if I'm honest, mm. but it's some... It's, it, it's got it's, a life of its own. It's, almost, yeah, it's yeah. a community mm. that I put together. A lot of people mm. ask me, where can we connect with other podcast listeners? Mm. Yeah. And the group is amazing. And um, someone called Amelia actually on that group. And I'm sure other people ha had the idea as well. came up with the idea of having meetups. So I think there are now 40 or 50 meetups in the UK alone. Brilliant. Weekly or two weekly, Feel Better Live More meetups, where people who love the podcast and love my books are getting together in their local environment, going for walks, going out in nature, and talking about some of the themes and talking about some of these ideas. And that is something that really, really excites me because mm. 
what started as a little idea to put out six podcasts has now turned into like a juggernaut each Wednesday yeah. at 1pm that takes yeah. up a lot of my mental energy each week. But now people are using it to meet up and, and I'm thinking about, you know, live events potentially where, you know, I feel better, live more live, yeah. live podcasts, like, you know, whatever. Um, if people listening to this or watching it, you know, feel free to fly through ideas. Can I ask you something else on that? Because, you know, it, it, what you've done with the podcast and the books and everything you do is, is, amazing i mean astonishing and at the rate that you've done it at and and you are having this amazing impact i think on people but how do you gauge and how do you sort of measure your own success do you know what i mean because you, you must because people must come up to you all the time going oh you, you're so successful but what does that word mean to you yeah it's it's um it's something i've actually thought about quite a lot um you know when you're sat by yourself at home in those quiet moments when no one's around, you know, whether you've sold hundreds of thousands of books or got hundreds of thousands of people listening to you a show each week, you know what? None of that matters. It really doesn't. In those quiet moments, you find it actually, are you satisfied with who you are? Are you happy in who you are? So for me, success has changed over the years. You know, I think that people pleaser side of me which i'm working hard to move away from that side of me that you know really sought validation from other people as a huge way in how i got my self worth oh people say it's you know yeah it makes me feel good i've really moved away from using external validation as a way of making me feel good like it doesn't really affect me that much anymore I, I it's about how i feel in myself i think many of us are chasing the wrong things i think i used to chase the wrong things mm. and i've realized that success for me is you know am i do i feel happy with who i am what are we doing all the things i'm doing even if no one was watching even if no one was reading my books would i still be wanting to put out that information yeah even if nobody was listening to these podcasts, would I still relish having these conversations each week with people? And would I be doing it anyway? Yeah, I'd like to think so. Mm. Um, but also how I define success is not through my work. Even though I'm proud of my work, and even though my mission is to help so many people, and I'm glad to see the impact it's having, really for me, it's all about family. Mm. It's about friends. It's about, um, you know, uh, for me, success is, can I do all this or can I cut back on some of this? So I've actually got dedicated, undistracted time with my wife and kids each week. Because mm. if I don't, what's the point? Yeah. Right? Mm. And, and I figured out for me, and it takes a while because you've got to go through these things. I don't think anyone's, you know, born out of the womb suddenly knowing all this stuff. You yeah. have to go through stuff and learn and go, oh, you know what? That actually hasn't made me that happy. Mm. You know, it's actually that stuff that makes me happy in those quiet moments. If the last few days of, you know, high stress to do with my mum's health and her fall, and if that has reminded me of anything, mm. it's reminded me of what's important in life. And rushing around and doing this and doing that. It's all very well. But you know what? I'm glad I was able to be there for my mum this mm, week. Yeah. And go and sleep on a floor for two nights and mm. make sure she's all set up mm. and everything's all right. And get a double bed in for her downstairs. She doesn't have to go upstairs at the moment while mm. she's feeling a bit frail. Mm. You know, I'm glad I've got time for that. Mm. I'm glad I cancelled other stuff because that stuff's important. Mm. And I realized actually, you know what? Am I spending enough time with my mum? Mm. You know, because you mentioned before I pop round regularly, I do. But you know what? I pop round. Mm. I don't really, often I'm, I'm doing stuff. I'm changing the light bulb or I'm, you know, taking the bin out for her or, you know, rushing. And, you know, maybe I could spend a bit more time when I go around and go, you know what? Forget all that stuff. Why don't I just make a cup of tea and sit there mm. for 20 minutes and have a chat with her? Yeah. You know, so I am constantly being reminded of what's important in life. In fact, life will always remind you of what's important if you pay attention to the signals. Mm. Uh, so that's important to me personally. And I am going to try and make some changes in that department. But the other thing I've figured out is really important for me professionally. And I've only really figured that out since Feel Better in 5 came out. I absolutely believe in the philosophy of that book for all of us, but particularly for schools. I think 
that the program in the book, five minutes a day on your mind, five minutes a day on your body, and five minutes a day on your heart, I think is the perfect children's well-being program. You know, you know, teachers always say the two things that, that are obstacles for us are time and money. I've taken them off the table. Everything only takes five minutes and everything's free, right? So it's very accessible for everyone. Now, I've given some talks at schools recently and I'm, I'm getting so many emails back from the schools saying, this is resonating. The kids are loving it. The parents are loving it. Mm. So many teachers have been in touch saying, we're using this. We're using breath counting with the kids. They love it. Uh, can we use this? And so I actually have got a few people on my team and we're recruiting for someone with experience in the teacher profession to help convert it with my help into a really actionable free plan for schools. And one of my big professional aims this year, and I'm not, I don't know if I can pull it off, right? I don't know. I don't know, but it won't stop me trying is, can I get this out there into as many schools as possible? Now, if I can do that, that would make me professionally very, very happy. Because if you can teach kids the importance of looking after themselves, well, fast forward 5, 10, 15, 20 years, hopefully a lot of those guys will have it sorted and won't have to be unlearning a lot of the stuff that we're having to unlearn. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, wonderful. What does really success good. mean? I think success means many different things, mm. depending on what aspects of my life you're talking about. But in a nutshell, it's, you know, am I successful enough to prioritize my own health, to make sure I've got enough time for me and I've got enough time for my friends, my wife and my children? I think you're doing a pretty good job, mate, to be honest. It's a lot, isn't it? And actually, a lot, apart from your inner circle, no one really sees just how busy you are at times. I mean, some of your weeks have been pretty insane. I mean, when you were promoting the book, I mean, you've done that three years on the trot. That month is rammed, isn't it? It, it is. Yeah. And look, I've mm. got to be, you know, I, I think I want to make clear that, mm. you know, I talk about the importance of downtime, mm. the importance of rest, the importance yeah. of looking after yourself. And me being busy and working hard doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not prioritizing those things. Mm. Mm. You know, I can be very disciplined and very productive because I have got a few practices. Like I genuinely do follow the principles in Field Brethren 5. That's how I stay healthy when I'm so busy. Mm. You know, I do farm it stay on my mind, farm mm. it stay on my body, farm it stay on my heart. If I've got time, I do more. Mm. But those are my base. They're the foundation for my life. So I know I'm paying attention to my physical health, my uh, mental health, and my emotional health every single day. Am I perfect? No, I miss the odd time, but generally speaking, I do that, mm. right? So that's what I do, but I'm also aware I don't kid myself. Like I know January's a busy month, mm. right? You know, it's a time of year when people are interested in health. It's a time of year when my books typically come out. So yes, I'm on the road. I'm doing live events. I'm giving interview after interview. My friend Gareth, who's, you know, he's the videographer for these podcasts. You know, he came and followed me this yeah, for a week in London mm. and to try and, you know, get I some footage. I remember I was there for a, a bit of it. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. he thought he knew what it was like and he just could not believe it. He said, this is insane. Mm. You're literally on giving in series from about 7.30 in the morning till about 10.30 at night mm. uh, every day for five days. I mean, your, your brain really hurts almost. It literally does. Hurts, you know, you get to the yeah. end of that yeah. and you, you suddenly, you, you, I, I describe it as you have, you don't have like mental gymnastics. You can't move from one part of your brain to another. It just feels <laughs> yeah. slow and sluggish. Yeah. But the point is, is that I'm aware that January is a busy month mm. and going into February. So I plan yeah. for uh, more downtime and less travel in February and March mm. in general. You know, yeah. I, so I've learned what I need to do. Yes. And, that, and, and I think that has take homes for everyone. Mm. Yeah. You never get to that state of perfect work-life balance. I don't think it exists. It's constantly moving. It's constantly shifting. Mm. But it's about self-awareness. It goes back to what we were talking about, emotional health. Mm. And Gabor Mate and Peter Cohen, it's about understanding yourself mm. and understanding that actually, yeah, fine, this is a busy time. People might be listening going, yeah, I've got busy time at work. You know, if you're an accountant, I'm guessing that, you know, the two or three weeks in January leading up to the mm. tax deadline <laughs> are probably hellish for you, mm. right, in terms of busyness. Fine, but that's probably not going to change year on year. That's probably going to be that busy month. So I'm, I hope some of them go, you know, in February and March, I want to make sure it's a bit lighter to recap so I can bring my body, my life back into balance, back into equilibrium. So I, like everyone else, I'm learning, mm. right? I don't, I don't have it perfect. I don't think perfect exists. I'm constantly trying to figure out 
um, what it is I'm, uh, how it is I can better look after myself, make the impacts I want to make professionally, but also have the time that I want personally. No, it's great. And I, I just thinking about what you're, what you're trying to do with this podcast. And I suddenly thought, you know, you're kind of searching for the perfect conversation. Would you sort of agree with that? Yeah, it's a nice way of putting it. It's a really nice way of putting it. I, I guess I am. I'm searching for that. You know how I know a good conversation? You know what I'm sure at the end? Because sometimes I'm like, oh, was that good? Were people like that or not? Mm. When I know it's gone well is when the time has flown by. Mm. When you suddenly look at the record and go, what, we've been talking for two hours. What happened there? Yeah. You know, that was like the John McAvoy conversation that I released on New Year's yeah, Day. Yeah, that, that was, was one of those one. where I was like, yeah. what, two hours and 40 mm. minutes? What happened there? Yeah. Um, it's, that, that was a really good one, actually. That's that was, my second yeah. favorite. Yeah. Very. But you maybe choose one. Which is harsh. <laughs> but but the, the, the point is, is that mm. it's kind of what I write about a lot is the flow state, mm. right? It's when you're in that state of mind where you're being stimulated, you're being challenged, but it's not so challenging that you actually switch off. Mm. You're in that sort of perfect zone where time stands still and it's energizing. And I guess, yeah, it's looking, it's, it's that constant search for the perfect conversation, even though, as I've just said, perfect doesn't exist. Listen, the best of luck with the next 100 episodes. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. And congratulations on reaching the big 100. Hats off. Well, thanks, Zane. Thanks for coming in. And uh, always a pleasure chatting.